But Canada's role as a high-profile member of the Commonwealth really catapulted into the international media spotlight when Prime Minister Harper took the decision not to go to the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Sri Lanka. Why did he take such a high profile and some would say controversial position? Well, I think it wasn't controversial, it was actually principled. It was a principled position that he had stated out early on in 2011 uh, at the earlier Chogam in Australia. And he said quite clearly with regard to Sri Lanka that they had to uh, show real progress in terms of reconciliation, real progress in terms of the rule of law and democratic reforms. And in fact, the Commonwealth stands for those things. So he felt it would, would not be appropriate, he said in 2011, unless there was some real progress. I think the, ki the critical thing is we were looking for progress and, and the Prime Minister and the government were looking for progress. Minister Baird was very strong in it as an advocate for human rights, democratic reforms, the rule of law. And frankly, Canada was very concerned about some of the things that were happening in Sri Lanka. So you can't say we stand for principles and then not stand for the principles. So our Prime Minister simply said, I'm going to stand on these principles. We clearly think the Commonwealth has a role to play in the world, but we are not happy with bringing all of the heads of government to Sri Lanka. And obviously, other people agreed with them because there was a whole bunch of heads of government that didn't go to the Sri Lankan uh, uh, Chogam. And I think it's important because the Commonwealth has a role to play in the world, but that role is based on the principles, the practices and the values that the Commonwealth espouses on its pieces of paper. And the pieces of paper aren't worth very much unless they're backed up with real action. There were concerns that the Canadian Prime Minister's decision not to attend the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Colombo in 2013 signified a diminished engagement with the Commonwealth. Do you think that's the case? Uh, no, I think actually it was an assertion that the only way the Commonwealth can make a contribution is if we stand for the principles that we espouse. Uh, there, a new Commonwealth Charter had just been signed by all the heads of government and Canada was an, you know, one of those signatories. And again, Canada says, if we say these words, we have to reflect them. So let me give you an example. When the Supreme Court Justice was uh, impeached by the government, the previous government of Sri Lanka, uh, that was in clear breach of Commonwealth, the, what they call the Latimer House Principles, which is the separation of the judiciary from the political arm, from the military arm, et cetera, right? Uh, and I think that uh, we said this was wrong. It was actually a clear breach of Commonwealth values and Commonwealth practices. A similar thing had happened in Pakistan. Pakistan was censured with regard to that by the Commonwealth, and Pakistan then recognized that. They, re they did reforms and brought, it, brought things back. So I think if the Commonwealth doesn't stand for those principles, we're in serious trouble. So the Prime Minister was asserting those. He was joined by other uh, heads of government. The, the head of government for Mauritius it was, was not there. The head of government for India was not there. But I think the Prime Minister had been clear on, from the outset. And in fact, our engagement in the Commonwealth is of critical importance because the Commonwealth can be a beacon of human rights, can be a beacon of the rule of law can be a beacon of uh, democratic reform. That does not mean that necessarily any of us in the Commonwealth family have attained those goals, but it's something we're striving for, and when someone clearly turns their back on those principles, it has to be you know, identified, put in the window, and there's gotta be consequences for that. Canada has repeatedly called for reforms to the Commonwealth. In practical terms, how can those be achieved and which of those reforms are the most pressing? First of all, the Commonwealth has to consistently be a guardian of human rights and a guardian of democratic institutions. You know, we are a family that has come out of the principles of parliamentary democracy. So it's very important that we, we watch for those and when they're being eroded, I think it's very important for the Commonwealth to identify that. Let's remember that people or countries want to join the Commonwealth because of the Commonwealth values and the value framework that we present to the entire world. So I think that's a critical component. And if you decide just, to, well, this isn't that big a deal or that's not, the trouble is they become very large deals after a while, right? So you can't simply turn a blind eye. You can't say, well, it's too difficult. There's a lot of things that require progress that are difficult to do. And certainly equality is one of them, uh, human rights is another one, and when there's a clear breach as we, you know, as we saw in Sri Lanka, as we see in other 
countries, it's very important, regardless of whether the country is Canada or um, you know, Bangladesh or India or Australia, we have to identify those and we have to stand for them. And then we have to listen to the response, but the response has got to be more than words. The response has got to be action-oriented, uh, on the ground, that affect people. And so we are going to continue to advocate for those things. And, you know, there will, there will occasionally be disagreement, but we can't turn our back on the principles that are the founding principles of the Commonwealth and expect the Commonwealth to have real meaning in the 21st century. The Canadian Prime Minister is expected to take a full role in the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Malta in November this year. What message specifically will the Prime Minister be taking to other heads of government? What would we like to see? We'd like to see you know, a real advocacy for human rights, for democratic reforms, where there are breaches in electoral practices, etc. We'd like to see people be willing to identify those and rectify them and make progress towards rectifying them. We obviously have a significant uh, item in our agenda, which is maternal and child health. We think it's a critical component. Uh, we'd like to do, we'd like to eliminate early childhood forced marriage. It's something that is simply a breach of human rights. And you know, in 90% of those cases, the human rights of young girls around uh, the Commonwealth. But we also think it's important that we provide for, you know, the expertise we have, for example, in things like resource development, natural resource development. Canada can be a positive player with regard to that. The development of legislative frameworks, we're glad to participate and help in that regard. And so I would hope that coming out of the Malta uh, heads of government meeting, there is a new commitment to, if you want, the rules of engagement for the Commonwealth. Uh, we all want to have sustainable, long-term economic growth for our countries. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, Canada or Vanuatu. Um, we want the same things for the people that we serve. But there are things that we have to learn. And one of them is if you can't create a sense of certainty and confidence from the outside investors in the rule of law in your jurisdiction, you're not going to be very successful in terms of sustaining economic development for your whole country. And a whole country is all the people that live in the country, regardless of what their religious practices and beliefs are, regardless of what they are. You know their race may be or their gender may be um, you know all of those things you know you've got to put those aside as you try and build a strong economic base for people and Canada will be advocating those things Canada's a very strong advocate of trade we think there's opportunities there but they're not every one of those goals carries with it sort of a menu of actions that you have to take it's important to recognize the differences in the Commonwealth you know Canada is the second largest country in the world uh, we are the northern half of, almost the northern half of North America. Uh, you know, Vanuatu is a very small country. Now, there are small island states that have a, clearly a different set of challenges and a different set of, um, you know, tools that they have to have in their toolbox to achieve their goals. But it's the foundation you stand on which is the same. It's the same foundation of value and the same foundation of principle that's critical if you're going to be successful. Looking wider afield, Canada is of course an Asia Pacific nation. Many of the nations of the Asia Pacific region are of course represented in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. But there is an argument that uh, Canada perhaps should be looking to this highly vibrant region which is stimulating the world economy and having an enormous amount of influence globally. Right. We have three oceans, the Atlantic, the Pacific and the Arctic. So I think we have a, a unique role that we can play in Canada, where we embrace the values and principles of the Commonwealth, and we embrace the idea of global trade, and we provide the globe with opportunities to thrive. So we have vast natural resources in Canada, vast energy resources, forestry resources, agriculture resources, and I think that Canada's role really is to kind of be a bridging nation that brings nations together, brings the Asia Pacific together with the Atlantic, if you want, and yes, we should be meeting the opportunities that exist between Canada and Korea and China and Japan and India and Bangladesh and the South Pacific, the APEC. But by the same time we're doing, at the same time we're doing that, we're launching into a major uh, trade agreement with Europe, uh, the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement. So we can bring all of these, this part of the human family together. And I think it's important to note that it's when we think that way about the rest of the world that Canada thrives and I think the world has an opportunity to thrive. We're sitting in this gloriously renovated building. 
Canada has invested a great deal in making this statement to the world, sitting on uh, Trafalgar Square in the heart of London. What further role can Canada play in the global economy and in a political context? Well, I think, I think first of all, the political context is important because I think the value framework that Canada brings to the table is, is critically important. And it's one that is embraced by many other countries, the Commonwealth countries for certain, the United States, Western Europe. You know, we believe that it's, when you provide people with the tools they need to pursue their goals and objectives, it's amazing what they can accomplish. And we should take down the barriers that divide us. So, you know, we have a country, again, the second largest country in the world, uh, and we have people from all over the world that are part of Canada. We have citizens from the Ukraine and citizens from, uh, uh, from the, the subcontinent, from India. We have uh, citizens from China. We have citizens from Australia. We have citizens from Africa and citizens from the Caribbean. Uh, the Hispanic population in Canada is growing. And one of the, the strengths we have is we can bring people together and we, we don't lock them out. Um, there's not very many others in Canada. We, we try to make it, our country a country that says to you, you're welcome here. You're welcome to contribute. This is the framework that Canadians have. These are the things we believe in. The reason you want to come to Canada is because Canada believes in those things. And I think, at least as a Canadian, I think one of the great opportunities I've had is I've never felt labeled out of anything. And I think Canada does a, sp a specific job of trying to bring people in to solutions and, and into sort of solving the challenges that we face. In terms of the global economy, we've been had a very prudent management of our economy. We've shown people that you can live within your means. We have a healthcare system that works. We have education that's available to people across the country. We have vast natural resources. And I think one of the things that Canadians can say clearly now is the most important natural resource we have is the people that live in Canada. And the, 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 the blending and the, the learning from one another's cultures and work building an understanding. We've got a long way to go before we're, we're where we'd like to be. But we think we're, we stand on a pretty good foundation. And I think that we tend to look at what others have to offer and be positive about the things they have, as well as say what's wrong, right? So you, there's no such thing as only problems. There's always solutions that flow from those problems, and Canada tries to pursue those. You talk about an inherent flexibility, the role that Canada is playing globally. But uh, there's been much discussion about the downgrading of another transatlantic relationship, namely the UK's relationship with the US. Has Canada benefited from that change? No, I think, honestly, Canada benefits from this, the strong historic cultural, traditional relationships that we have with the United Kingdom. Uh, but I also think we benefit you know, from the relationships we have with the cultures of Western Europe. We benefit from the relationships we have from the, the cultures of China. You know, Canada's a young country. You know, Canada has, you know, has only been here since 1867 as an entity. And we've invited people in. And we've had lots of trouble. As we, you know, lots of rocky roads. There's lots of things that happened in the early 20th century that no Canadian is sitting there and looking at with pride today. In fact, we try and say, that was wrong and we can, we can learn from that. And I think that's what's important. Let's learn from other cultures. Let's learn the ways that we can work together. Let's understand the problems that face us in the world today. And then let's act on those within the framework of values that we have as Canadians. You know, I think that's what's critical. And I think if we set our goals high enough, we can strive for them. And we shouldn't be disappointed if we don't reach them immediately. And I think we're always going to strive for them. It's just the way the world is. That's where you get progress. That's how you, get, that's how you bring people together. So I, I do think that Canada has an important role to play in the world. Uh, we're not the strongest country in the world. We're not the biggest military in the world. Uh, you know, certainly as you come to the United Kingdom and you think of all of the so-called soft diplomacy that has come to the world from the United Kingdom. Parliamentary democracy is one, sport is another, you know, they kind of invented sport for us. Uh, but it's something that we can all learn from and we can, we can take advantage of. So hopefully we can create an environment for learning, an environment that builds understanding, an environment that understands that as all of us progress as the human family, we all benefit. Hi, Commissioner. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Great to talk to you.